good evening, uh, dear friends. Uh, my venerable uh, colleague, Mang Sanans, uh, dear friends in Dhamma who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube Live. Uh, we are about to begin the uh, our biweekly sutra discussion uh, with all the venerable uh, monks and nuns joining us from different cities. So let us uh, begin the session uh, by paying respect and homage uh, to the Buddha by reciting Namo Tathra three times together. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa I pay my respect and homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened Buddha. Dear friends in Dhamma, <clears throat> uh, with uh, uh, respect and gratitude, I would like to welcome uh, all my senior monks and other colleague monks and nuns to this bi-weekly sutra discussion. So today uh, we are very uh, fortunate uh, to have uh, the most venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Um, and uh, we also have uh, the most venerable Bhante Yoga Vachar Rahula. And these are uh, uh, prominent monks in our time uh, who have done a great service to the Buddha Sasana. Uh, by authoring many books, translating the Tripitaka into English. And uh, it's a great um, moment for us. And I consider it is our, our good karma to have these uh, uh, venerable monks. Um, Bhante Bodhi is joining us from New York City. And uh, Bhante Yoga Vajurahula is joining us from Washington, D.C. Then among us, we have Venerable Yutta Dhammo joining us from uh, Hamilton, Stony Creek. And we have Bhante Uparatana uh, from, joining us from Washington, D.C. And then we have Bhante Kusala joining us uh, from uh, Toronto, from our temple. And we have Venerable uh, Samten Chordan joining us from Ottawa. And we have Venerable uh, Vera Pano joining us from Washington, D.C. And we have Venerable Punarjan uh, Suwarna uh, joining us from Boston. And we have Venerable uh, Sister Kema joining us from India. It's early morning for you. <laughs> uh, and then we have Bhante Vangsananda joining us from Seattle. And then we, among us, we have uh, my teacher, Bhante Mudita, joining us from uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, but uh, it would be nice, uh, uh, Hamadru, to have your video on so that people can see. And also, uh, Bhante Wangsan, and this possible, have the video on. Uh, so, uh, two weeks ago, we uh, had a nice discussion um, about the practical Buddhism. And uh, I would, uh, what prompted us to uh, have this discussion is this book, the title of this book, <laughs> authored by 
Uh, yes, Adamo, uh, Biko, I will, can you bring it to the full screen? Yeah. Uh, that document. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. This one, uh, Practical Buddhism authored by, uh, oh, this right? <laughs> it is too bright. <laughs> yeah, you can go back. So uh, we had a very good discussion about practical Buddhism and a lot of uh, wonderful ideas were coming out from the venerable monks and nuns. And then uh, uh, some of you uh, suggested that we should have uh, uh, one more discussion about the same uh, topic. And uh, so we said, okay. And then I was thinking of some other months and what came to my mind was uh, Bhante Bodhi <laughs> and also Bhante Yoga Vajrahula. So I sent an email invitation to these uh, uh, masters and uh, they replied to me uh, that they said they would join and I was so thrilled. <laughs> and uh, so uh, what uh, I said, uh, Bhante Bodhi, uh, I said something very interesting in the email. I will uh, uh, talk about it later. Uh, but before we begin the discussion, uh, uh, Bhante Bodhi would like to make an announcement regarding his upcoming uh, the annual uh, event, uh, uh, the symposium or conference. Uh, he had it uh, at the beginning of this month in in California, this time it's in East, uh, I think maybe in, in New York. So Bhante Bodhi, uh, I would like to invite you to make an announcement about your upcoming uh, conference. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. And this is directed mostly to the lay people who are watching this event. Um, we have an organization called Buddhist Global Relief which sponsors projects around the world that help communities suffering from chronic hunger and malnutrition. Currently, we have 50 projects in countries ranging from Mongolia to Cambodia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, India, through several African countries, Haiti, Nicaragua, to projects in the United States. And our main fundraising event in the year is a, usually we have a walk to feed the hungry, which takes place usually in the fall with about 10 walks around the United States. But because of the COVID pandemic, we can't actually hold the walks in person. So we've been having online events. We're having two online events. One already took place covering the Western states of the United States. That was early October. Now this coming Saturday, October 30th, we'll be having another online event featuring guest speakers and overviews of our projects. This will be from 1 to 3 p.m. on Eastern Time. And you can find out details by going to the website of Buddhist Global Relief and then registering for this event. Okay, that should do it. Thank you. Okay, amazing. Um, I think uh, last... Uh, uh, Last time when we had this unique discussion, uh, Dhamma, um, uh, charity and humanity, that was the main topic and people really loved it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I received uh, feedbacks from the, the people who follow me. They have actually uh, made some uh, contributions to your organization, Bhante. <laughs> and I was so happy. And I said, they're looking forward to this upcoming yeah. conference. Um, so, oh, among us, we also have now Bhante Sila. Welcome, Bhante. Um, so now, uh, the Bhante Bodhi, there's uh, something that you said, uh, which, uh, I, which is very interesting. I think, let me uh, read out to you. <laughs> uh, what do you mean by practical Buddhism? I thought all of Buddhism is practical. I always look to the Mangala Sutta to explain how a lay person can apply Buddha Dhamma to their life. So, uh, 
Would you like to expand on this, Bante? Well, I, well, I raised the question, what is meant by practical Buddhism? So yeah. I, I didn't realize that this was the title of a book by Venerable Youth to Dhammo. So maybe he should expand on what is meant by yeah. what he means by practical Buddhism. <laughs> okay, then. You, whenever you tell them more. Uh, yeah. We can't hear you. No, we cannot hear you when we tell them more. Nobody can hear me? No, we cannot hear you. Something went wrong from here. right back okay now we can we can hear you now okay so we did talk a little bit about this last time i was thinking about some of the things that were said someone else asked a similar question i think uh venerable kusula maybe um but i i a, i'm a little surprised i guess um the the distinction isn't between practical and impractical buddhism it's between practical and theoretical because it is possible to be very intellectual or theoretical about uh, topics like Buddhism, mm -hmm. or philosophical even, without actually putting it into practice. And that was basic, basically the idea. Mm -hmm. But it was also specifically related to um, making practical those aspects of Buddhism that seemed out of reach, that, that there wasn't a clear idea for some people on how to actually put them into practice, like the deep topics of the Four Noble Truths and Paticca Samuppada and so on. So if you look at the book, the contents, uh, that was sort of what it was focusing on, trying to answer the question is how, how could you practically approach the Four Noble Truths instead of thinking about them theoretically and, and trying to grasp them intellectually. And Paticca Samuppada, how does it, how does it, to uh, play a part in your practice of Buddhism. Um, and there were several other topics, some, some that showed how practical Buddhism is, was the idea. Mm -hmm. Maybe could, could you give like a summary account, a very brief account of the practical approach to Paticca Samuppada? That would be interesting. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, one of the main aspects is breaking it into parts, uh, the part that is objective experience. So when we are uh, engaged with our experiences, our impulse is to label them as good or bad and, and to judge them. So if we have pain, that's a bad thing. If we have pleasure, that's a good thing. But if you look at Paticca Samuppada, one interesting thing is to show that it's only when tanha arises or, or to talk about how, how you can break it apart. And if at Vedana there is no vijja, then, then tanha will not arise. And to try and, and well, at least to, to use Paticca Samuppada to talk about the different aspects of your experience. I mean, it brings up two important topics, which are tanha and the vijja. And it, 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 make, it makes a useful teaching from a practical perspective. Uh, okay, so this is going to, this is a very friendly uh, uh, discussion we are having among the venerable monks and nuns, and uh, anyone uh, can raise a question, uh, or if you have uh, any, uh, uh, anything to share, or uh, you feel free to share that with us or with our audience. And uh, oh, if you have questions, you feel free to ask the questions from all the senior monks. And uh, I would like to ask this uh, question from uh, Bante Rahula. <laughs> I know Bante Rahula is the, uh, the desktop was hacked. And uh, first he said he, he may not be able to join. So I was kind of um, not happy. But today I received an email that he would use his uh, phone, uh, cell phone. And uh, so uh, we are ha very happy to have Bhante Rahula. Uh, Bhante Rahula, what do you think of this question the, about practical Buddhism? Or do you have anything to add? 
Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Bhante. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, now, yeah. now we can hear you. Well, I didn't hear the discussion uh, last week, but uh, from what I just heard now, uh, I kind of, uh, you know, approach practical Buddhism uh, in a little different way in actual how to implement, especially the practice of mindfulness, because everything starts with mindfulness. If we're not mindful of our thoughts, our intentions, our feelings, then it's going to be very difficult to apply, uh, you know, some other, other things. So uh, I had an interesting experience yesterday. You mentioned my computer got hacked. That's true. <laughs> in a very severe way. And uh, I, I, have had, I applied, you know, I practice what I preach. That means I, uh, I uh, practiced uh, pausing when I, when I discovered that was going on. I paused, I took a few deep, slow breaths. I felt any uh, tension arising in my uh, mind or you know, the body and I just paused without reacting. I just took a few deep, slow breaths and, and uh, on the out breath, relaxing the body. And actually I call that an m, &M. So in my uh, pro uh, advice to people, especially after retreats, we know that there's a retreat syndrome going on that when people go to a retreat, uh, it's very organized and kind of a sterilized environment. So they can kind of basically, you know, meditate with the group energy and without distractions. But when they go home, uh, they're not able to integrate uh, that uh, practice of a sterilized retreat environment into their hectic uh you know, daily lives. And, uh, you know, normally we advise people to meditate twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. And, and then people might do that. But in between, there is uh, eight or 10 hours when people are not very mindful. And if they meditate for an hour in the morning, they kind of pat themselves on the back and they say, oh, I did my Buddhism today. And then during the day, they might not be so mindful. So anyway, uh, what I usually uh, advise people in a practical way to help to integrate the practice of, of mindfulness and also reflecting and so on is to practice an M&M. &M. So an M&M &M is what I call a minute meditation <laughs> minute of mindfulness. And this is a very specific practice that every hour during the day, uh, you pause for one minute, let go of that push to the future, let go whatever your mind was chewing on and bring your attention to the body. And actually the best time to do it is when you're standing actually, having just finished one activity before starting another one, or if you're sitting, but so you, you kind of freeze in your tracks physically and mentally, and you take a deep, slow breath, taking a deep, slow breath and holding the breath in a few moments is one of the best ways of kind of instantly calming uh, the body and mind down. Now I've learned this through my yoga practice and most people know me as, you know, integrating yoga and uh, meditation. So I found that as a very uh, valuable point. So they try to, in that one minute when you pause, you can reflect on what your mind was doing in that last uh, minute and to let go of any negative thoughts. And you could practice even some 30 seconds or 45 seconds of metta. You know, if you were having ill will towards a person in the last hour, you know, send them metta. May they be well and happy, free from suffering. Mm. Or you simply uh, break that neurotic push into the future, what I call the neurotic push into the future, most people's bodies and minds are always one step ahead of their, where well, their mind is a step ahead of their body. And uh, they're rushing around to the, the next thing without pausing much. So uh, to come to the present moment, to feel the body, feel the feet pressing the floor, <clears throat> take a couple of deep breaths and just 
you know, remind yourself of the present moment. Ah, standing, standing, sitting, sitting, hearing, hearing, uh, thinking, thinking. Be able to kind of pull yourself back and just observe what state your body and mind is in. And then, as I mentioned, if you're holding some ill thoughts, to, uh, you could even practice forgiveness for forgiving some person for insulting you, uh, you know, in the last hour or forgive yourself if you did something unmindful and you're, you know, kind of blaming yourself for doing something unmindful so you can forgive yourself. So the idea is that you relax any tension and stress or negative thoughts in that one minute, and it is possible to do that. And then you start the next hour fresh, you know, and most people keep on carrying over their moments of stress and tension hour by hour throughout the day. And by the end of the day, they're kind of a, you know, a nervous wreck and uh, take it out on others or have to get a drink or something. So uh, doing these, uh, so the M&Ms are a way of releasing stress hour by hour rather than accumulating the stress hour by hour. And then by the end of the day, you might feel like meditating in the evening because one of the biggest complaints of so many people is, oh, the big day was so busy, I'm so stressed out, and you know, I didn't feel like meditating. And yeah, that, that's, that's true, that's right. But if they learn how to release the stress hour by hour by practicing uh, these m ms and then that will go a long way to help uh, feel better at the end of the day. And we chose a minute because anybody can really stop for a minute. Uh, you'd have to really be a, a skeptic or, a, you, know, a, you know, to say uh, that you, know, you can't stop for one you know, minute, an hour, because you waste so much time anyway. So you can do a lot in one minute in terms of, uh, you know, letting, uh, you know, forgiving anybody that uh, did something to you, sending out metta, or just relaxing the nervous system. Just, just taking a few deep breaths to really get a hold of yourself to come back into the present moment. Uh, and uh, that way you'll be more mindful than if something happens in the next hour. Hopefully you would have recharged, it's what I call a mini battery charge. So these M&Ms are like meditation supplements, right? So people take supplements, you know, to supplement their diet and so on. So these are supplements to supplement even if we do longer meditation in the morning or evening to uh, connect the dots in between to, to uh, do the mini, the mini mindfulness charge uh, throughout the day. So when you get some unexpected news or something happens, you'll be more quick to be able to say, okay, this could happen, relax, and, uh, you know, then, then be able to consider what is the proper step to apply right effort and so on. So this is what I found to be a real, you know, practical, uh, you know, uh, a practical way to, because it's practical because anybody should be able to stop for a minute and you don't have to be in any special place. Uh, and, uh, you know, it should be doable for most people. And yeah. especially if people don't meditate longer, it's even more important mm -hmm. that uh, they do that and uh, they'll reap the benefits of that, of just doing something that simple as pausing and coming to the present moment. So that, that's, the, you know, one thing that I, and apart from one minute, even, you know, we have 10 seconds, 15 seconds here or there during the day, when also, if we know how to do that, when we're standing around waiting for something, the checkout line in the supermarket or in the dentist office, or, you know, instead of looking around or looking through magazines, uh, we can just uh, feel the sensations on our body and just take a few deep breaths and send out metta to, uh, you know, to people and so on. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting, Abhante. Thank you for sharing that practical aspect of Buddhist practice, uh, M and M practice, uh, and I think. Um, even uh, I have seen people uh, advertising one minute meditation, something like that. Uh, so, dear Venerable uh, Sangha members, if you have any uh, questions regarding that MNM practice, uh, feel free to uh, uh, ask the questions 
And if you have something else to add into this practice, again, feel free to share with us. And uh, if you have any uh, uh, questions, of course, if you want to tell a story, share something, please uh, raise your hands. And also this is a kind reminder to all our uh, friends who are watching us in YouTube and Facebook. If you have any questions to ask from Venerable Monks, and uh, please uh, uh, make a comment uh, with your questions, we will take your question. Uh, so now we have Venerable uh, Kusala raised his hand to maybe to tell a story or share something. Venerable Kusala. Thank you, Bhante Namami Sangha. So uh, with the story of Bhante Yoga Rahula's computer getting hacked, and how he responded to it. Uh, it's a great example. Um, and in that explanation, I didn't hear him showing any frustration or any anger, or even trying to call technicians and getting spammed again. These things happen to people, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they are in trouble like that, you know, in these countries. Um, so that's really practical Buddhism. And I see in the book, Venerable Yutta Dhammo has uh, included two suttas. One of them is the Girimananda Sutta in which we find uh, the 10 perceptions. One of them is the perception of impermanence. The other, uh, especially these two connect with perhaps the computer getting hacked story the anatta perspective that we detach ourselves from the problem and then now we look at the goal of buddhism which is to eradicate craving um, and i think this example brought buddhism closer to our lives um, because just while we are dealing with life's problems we can see how even the Giriman and the perspective can help us practice Buddhism and detach ourselves. And, um, and it's because Bhante Sarnapala mentioned about stories uh, and Sister Kema is here. I think we have, um, well, she can explain this better, but I'm trying to like uh, re recalling a conversation between she and I in Missouri, I think in 2011, one, you know, once, and she had this, um, she had to go see a physical therapist because of a, you know, leg pain or something. And she was practicing, you know, this is not my body. This is, this is not me. And then suddenly the physical therapist pushing some part of the body and saying, mm -hmm. oh, this is me. <laughs> so suddenly, you know, none of that insight um, sometimes uh, helps uh, with severe pain, but it's in a, although it's funny, but in that there is, you know, practice, you know, there is, you know, for us to see that we don't have to really be involved uh, with everything that we experience. Um, I have been visiting hospital patients and sometimes when we, have a conversation, you know, more than praying, we try to share some insight, you know, um, saying things like, may you have wisdom to detach from any pain. So uh, this wisdom, I think is practical Buddhism. We, we, we unplug, you know, anything works when you unplug it for a minute and then replug it. So even with pain that we feel, or frustrations after a computer getting hacked or, you know, getting burnt or anything, you know, if it is not so severe, we can always use that anatta perspective and unplug ourselves and rather than uh, looking at the theory, which is, you know, this I is not mine, the form is not mine. So bringing it, you know, bringing that knowledge and wisdom to the actual feelings you know, rush of feelings that we feel um, so that right there you can see all that tension vanishing and our wanting to control that situation also disappearing so we can we can just smile and be present really be present and 
you know, seeing how craving no longer is present in that experience. And I think the next moment of that person is so peaceful. And, uh, and right there, I think MNM could be used uh, even for a minute, maybe longer, so that the person use the inner strength to cope with that situation. So that's just my five cents uh, to this conversation for now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Venerable Kusala, for sharing your insights with us. And, uh, and I, I, I think uh, that's very interesting, even uh, when uh, Bhante Rahula says m and practice, that maybe uh, is a way of becoming uh, a dolphin, <laughs> breathe like a dolphin for one minute. <laughs> it will help you. Uh, so I, I have a question. Uh, I know uh, uh, Sister Kema, you asked a question and Bante Seela also uh, shared something uh, very interesting. I will get, uh, get back to that. Uh, but I, I, would like, I, I would like to know from uh, uh, Bhante Bodhi, uh, Bhante Bodhi, you have translated uh, so many sutras into English. And, um, and, I, and of course, you, you know word by word or sentence by sentence. According to your perspective, like when people talk about practical Buddhism, mm -hmm. now, what can you uh, tell people about that? <laughs> <laughs> there are just so many ways to understand the idea of practical Buddhism. Yeah. So maybe a way we could, it's a scheme that I use to structure a book that I compiled an anthology called In the Buddha's Words. So the scheme that I used was to classify the suttas according to the aim of those suttas, the aim of the, of the message of the sutta or the intention behind the sutta. So I used a threefold scheme. Uh -huh. One is to promote good and well-being and happiness in this present life. That is in terms of mundane goals, mundane purposes. So in that category, I included the teachings that deal with family life, the way husbands should relate to wives, wife to husband, parents to children, children to their parents, um, teachings on right livelihood, um, teachings on social solidarity, and also teachings on how the king, in this case, the wheel-turning monarch, should govern the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now we ha we'd have to transpose that to democratic or supposedly democratic systems of government. Okay, so those are practical teachings concerned with promoting the mundane well being and happiness of people in this present life. Okay, the second category of teachings is, are teachings that promote the well-being and happiness directed towards future lives in the sense of the practices that conduce to a fortunate rebirth, a happy rebirth. So to understand this level, one would have to bring in at least the the some of the theoretical teachings of understanding the workings of karma and how the karma governs the rebirth process. So that would be something like the theoretical basis for this. But then at the practical level, we would have the teachings concerned with dana, with giving, generosity, sila, observing precepts. And I would call this the meritorious types of bhavana, of meditation, particularly maybe the lower levels of the Brahma Viharas and the devotional meditations like recollection of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Um, so a lot of these practices would also correspond with the practices that aim at promoting well-being and happiness in this present life. But now the aim has shifted, even though the practice might be the same. So for example, observing precepts would also promote harmony and harmonious relations, 
between people in this present life, but when you undertake the precepts with the aim of a fortunate rebirth, though the undertaking is the same, though the precepts are the same, the motivation is different. Now you're undertaking the precepts for the purpose of creating the wholesome karma that will be conducive to a good rebirth. Okay, then the third level of, of well, the third governing purpose in the suttas is the attainment of ultimate liberation. This is the paramatta, the supreme good. In other words, the attainment of nibbana. So there we would bring in, you know, the, all of the teachings in the framework of sila, samadhi, and panya, aiming at vimuti, at liberation. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. I, I remember uh, uh, that you have actually beautifully uh, expanded um, the practical teachings of the sutras. I uh, think the Pali terms uh, you have used is called Sanditika Sukha, uh, Samparaika Sukha, and uh, Paramatta Sukha, something like that. Yeah, it was Dita Dhamika Sukha. Oh, Dita okay. Yeah, yeah. Then um, Samparayika Sukha and, par and Paramatta, the Supreme Good. So, so the, the, the whole purpose of this is a Sukha. We are using the word Sukha, happiness. I think it's Hita, not only Sukha, but Hita Sukha, well-being and happiness. I think there's also, I don't know what the Pali is, but in Thai they say Prayod, which I think from, comes from Payojana. Isn't there a Pali? Oh, word? I see. Yeah, Payojana could mean the purpose. There's the three, because yeah. in Thai, it's a very common teaching to talk about Dita Dhamma Payojana, uh, Samparaika Payojana, and Paramata Payojana. Prayot, they say in Pali, in, in Thai. Yeah, Payojana would be more a commentarial word. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, it has the meaning of purpose. Yeah. So, so the Payojana is, is that the word beneficial? Payojana is more like purpose. Purpose, okay. Or application, one could say. Okay. Yeah. So it is Payojana or Payoga? It, it would be Payojana. Yeah. Payojana. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, no, uh, I, I think that's, that's very, very insightful for us, for our listeners. And uh, there is a, uh, is there any venerable uh, monk or nun who would like to ask a question or shall I uh, take some questions from the audience? What do you think? Um, so uh, here is a question. Um, it's actually in the uh, YouTube, someone by the name Kit, K-I-T. Hello monks, I have a question. What is the skillful approach to dealing with racist, aversive individuals that we may have to work around? Uh, anyone? I, I think uh, Bhante Ramana. <laughs> uh, well, uh, first of all, again, if they're saying something, uh, take a deep breath and then observe what your reaction is. But also, you know, you have to understand, have compassion for this person's, uh, their ignorance, you know, and, and their conditioning and how they're brought up. And so uh, a bit of compassion uh, to them uh, and not uh, having, uh, you know, checking any, you know, ne really negative thoughts toward them. And... Uh, but you know, this, those are very difficult situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but that's the first thing I would say is pause and not let what they're saying, uh, you know, generate a lot of negative uh, thoughts in you. And then, uh, then you might respond to them in, in some way, but usually these people are very hardened in their viewpoints. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. easy to, uh, to uh, change them at, at that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say under present circumstances, of course, it depends a lot on the person, but it might be a little bit dangerous to directly confront a person like that. They can turn violent and they might even have a weapon with them. So you have to be very careful. 
can Bante Bodhi, can you give me uh, give us an example like how to <laughs> confront the people like that? <laughs> no, I would say I my advice is not to confront them. Okay, not to confront. Okay. I said don't confront. Okay. Okay, interesting. Any, any, anyone else who would like to add something? If, if, if you're close to Buddhahood, you might try to confront them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh if, you're, if you're a Buddha or Arahant. <laughs> um, I would be, uh, okay, uh, Sister Kema, you're raising your hand. Uh, I think uh, you have to unmute yourself. I promise I'll be short this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. No, uh, I think the word confront is a difficult one to accept because if someone comes at me, um, I understand a primary rule in Buddhism and that is that I can't change anyone else and I can't bring them anywhere. I have to show them an avenue by which they can change themselves. You see? So when somebody comes at me, um, usually I give them a big smile and, you know, then I listen to what they're saying and then I come down to wherever they are and it's an untrained mind or a trained mind that's here. It isn't, like always looking at it as if it's, you know, where is the person? I mean, you have to understand. I mean, I worked with lumberjacks and I worked with uh, heavy equipment operators and truck drivers when I was working with building the center in the mountains and down in Missouri. And I had to come down to their level of where they were coming from and bring similes home to them that they understood and work with ways of talking to them. So we ended up laughing and going and getting coffee and continuing work. And if somebody was, you know, affronting Bonte or affronting me, you know, we would pick it up. I would pick it up usually at their level, you see? So doesn't mean I go down to their level. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about understanding where they're coming from when they're talking and where they, where they are living and what's going on. And I know things are really rough uh, in the United States right now, very rough and very, very changed from the way uh, I grew up, from the way Bhikkhu Bodhi grew up or any of us grew up in. We never thought we would see the things that are going on there now. And I haven't been home to see them. And it's very sad to watch what's going on. Uh, because it's very unbalanced, you know, from both sides, both sides, not one side or the other. It's very, very, very un unbalanced, you know. But the way that I deal with things is, um, is, first of all, we look at right effort. And we say there were four steps in the original right effort. The first two steps were to recognize an unwholesome mind state, and then to to let that unwholesome mind state go. We call this the purification phase of right effort. And then there was the second part of it. And the second part was retraining the person, your mind <clears throat> or the person's mind. And that was bringing up a wholesome to replace it. And then to keep the wholesome going and keep creating things that were as in the wholesome, unwholesome mind direction and everything. So see, we have a lot, a whole lot out there right now of people from both sides just wanting to play the first two parts of stop doing that, throw that away and stop doing that and then walk away. Well, of course, it's going to come back tomorrow because you didn't replace it with the, uh, with the wholesome and continue to work with that, you see. So you're not changing the mind. You're simply uh, stopping one particular incident, you see. And so this is, this is the difficult part for me is the loss of the understanding of right effort, the sixth part of the Eightfold Path, the loss of it over time. Because so many people approach this as, well, just stop being angry. You see, just stop being angry. And so the man goes home for a week and he's not angry. Then he comes back to the psychologist who he paid $150 to last week. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to pay him again to check up how he's doing. And then when he checks up, the man says, well, how did it feel? The, the doctor says, you see, that you weren't angry. And he says, well, 
it felt really good. He says, good, good. Give me $150. Let's make an appointment for next week. And he sends him home. You see, but what happens is when he's driving home, he thinks, wait a second, that was $300. And then he says, I'm still, that's not a good thing. I don't, what did I get for $300? And he comes home and he goes up the driveway with his car and he bumps the bike and gets mad and yells at the kids going in and kicks the dog and goes inside and has a fight with his wife. Well, how did that happen? That happened because of the lack of the Brahma Vihara usage, which was a key piece that was given to Rahula by his father in, you know, Sutta number 62. And we forget the power of the Brahma Viharas. Now, if you've been exposed to the Brahma Viharas as groups of people coming together and sending loving kindness, that's nice and it's good. And it's nothing wrong with these kinds of community things. But the Brahma Viharas was much, much, much more than that because it promised something. And actually I have seen this come through with people, you know, and if you're teaching Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upaka in a connected causal relationship, and you're doing it in a persistent, consistent type of practice, then those things will come true for you. And I have had people come back during retreats and after retreats. And after I followed a retreat for 30 days and checked up on them, seen the difference in their life. Because if you're practicing metta in your mind, then no thoughts of ill will, they will be abandoned. And when it turns into karuna, then the thoughts of cruelty will not be able to come up. And if you're putting it in the forefront when joy is there, there's no discontent. You have no discontent, you see? And then when you reach equanimity, and it's not just one big four-footed equanimity I'm talking about in the fourth jhana, I'm talking about the balanced equanimity you're developing from the first, second, and third and uh, levels as you're going through to reach a four-footed equanimity that you can have all the time around in the house when your computer breaks down and other things like that, you see? But what equanimity is bringing you is, a, is no more aversion to anything. So it isn't the person that you confront. See, just by saying I, I was confronted by and assuming that that was meant to confront you. Yeah, they want to confront you and see if you'll pop right now. Everybody wants to confront everybody. As far as I can see, if I check up on it once a week, I dare not touch it anymore because, you know, I don't want that in my head all week. They just confront each other, poke each other, try to make each other pop. Who knows what's going to be there in the end? None of us do, but, but, you have to have a sense of humor about this because <laughs> even on the small scale, middle scale or large scale, there's a Nietzsche. It's going to change. Everything has to change. We all have been thrown into a place where Bhikkhu Bodhi left the monastery and started walking across bridges and with thousands of people raising money and actually feeding the people. This is a <laughs> wonderful thing that happened. Wonderful thing, you see? <laughs> So that is, that is, uh, so uh, that, uh, that was, I was going to ask, you know, uh, as, and I say, it's good that Sister Kema, you, you said that. Uh, Bhante Bodhi is walking uh, on the streets with thousands of people to feed the uh, hungry people around the world. Uh, is that part of practical Buddhism? I think so, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> absolutely, positively. Okay. You know, People want to move. They want to march. They want to be part of a group, you know? Yeah. So, and I remember, I, re I met you once when I came to Chang'an Monastery a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, and I, I always thought he's there and he's translating and he's teaching classes. And I know people in New York that love your classes who are friends of mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they tell me about them all the time. And the things that came out of your course for me and teaching, I didn't know what who was in the potter shed until you told me. <laughs> in number is that, 140. Is that, is that part of, a, 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 there's another movement, it's called Engage Buddhism. So um, it, it could it be Engage Buddhism? Uh, Bhante Bodhi, what do you think? Yeah, certainly. I, usually 
we seem to often we think of practical Buddhism, or we conceive of it in a very personal and privatized sense, what I do with my mind, how I deal with the stresses and tensions and challenges that I meet around them. How do I preserve my equanimity, my balance of mind? But also part of practical Buddhism is, I would say, how following the principles of the Buddha's teaching do we act to alleviate the suffering around us by taking action that will directly help people who are facing various types of, su of suffering, not only the inner psychological suffering, but suffering due to especially poverty, social oppression, and so forth. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, and just the, the way uh, uh, Sister Kama mentioned about walking, the walks to feed the hungry, the way this actually started, I think this was back in 2007, I had a dream that I had walked down the length of Manhattan with my arms ball going, <laughs> going on arms round. So I had this dream and then I thought someday I'm going to have to do that. Then in, I think it was the year 2010, a young man from Oregon came to stay with me for a few months. He wanted to learn Pali. And then I asked him when he, he was here, have you ever been to New York City? And he said he passed through it one time coming out from the airport, but he's never actually been in the city itself. So then I said, why don't we see the city full in a full scale way by walking the entire length of Manhattan? And so we started out from New Jersey, actually Fort Lee, New Jersey. We walked across the George Washington Bridge to what is it, 179th Street? Then we turned on Broadway and we walked all the ways down as far as Chinatown, which is on the southern tip of Manhattan. Mm. Fantastic. So, yeah, so then sometime later, about a week or two later, I told some of my students that we had done this walk down the length of Manhattan. And at that time, Buddhist Global Relief had started. And then one of them came up the idea, why don't we do a walk for the purpose of feeding the hungry. And I, I, I think now I, I, I see the similar thing being done by uh, some young monks and nuns in New York City. From this uh, uh, monks and nuns from the Sky Cloud Monastery, I think. Uh, yeah, this is Venerable uh, Sudasso. Sudasso and Aya Soma and other. Yeah, people. yeah. They they go Pindapata at the. There's a farmers market. Okay. At Union <laughs> Square. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Good. It's quite interesting. Like that, how these monks are nuns are walking on the streets <laughs> in these busy streets. <laughs> so, uh, Bhante Kamalasiri, you raise your hand. I'm pretty sure you have something to share with us. Uh, <laughs> actually, it is not the sharing uh, the philosophical thing. Just only I want to something because of the sister Kema mentioned about the Bikubodhi's uh, generosity works. Yeah. Uh, it is okay if we are happy about uh, that thing also, but uh, Bikubodhi's leading and best thing is Dhammadana, <laughs> not the, not the army, <laughs> other than us, Dhammadana. Uh, therefore, it is better if we think about that, uh, the if we help him uh, for his other generosity works, then he can save his time and energy to translate Dhamma and uh, other works as he did before also. <laughs> so it's a, it's a kind of uh, kind suggestion you're making? <laughs> yes, the, <laughs> I, I asked from other people, other members they, who listen to this, they, it is because we don't want to waste his time for this things to uh, because it also another big project yeah, yeah but it doesn't actually take much of my time because we have buddhist global release relief has a staff of lay people who are very competent very effective uh -huh. so I, I don't have to spend time doing the either the routine work with that that is done by a, a lay staff i think Bante, kindly if, if you can explain to that how people can join with that and uh, contribute and other things 
Yeah, I, I'd suggest just going to the website. Um, the, the website is Buddhist Global Relief, and there one would find out how to make uh, donations. Uh, yeah, I think three, three weeks, uh, four weeks ago, we had a special discussion about the Dhamma yeah. uh, and the charity and humanity. And uh, so a lot of people actually joined the online conference, the West Coast and now East Coast uh, conference is coming up. And please visit that website, globalrelief.org. The website, it has all the details. And please support this movement. It is a part of practical Buddhism, you know, yeah. alleviating the suffering pains of the humanity. Um, any I'm other... just curious, um, Venerable Bodhi is uh, mentioning about that first walk in Manhattan. And I'm just curious what the response from the community was at that time and, or like did it pick up eventually or was that first day itself was surprisingly great um, that first walk uh, I mean uh, the walk for hunger walk not yeah the walk. The, the, the walk through Manhattan was not a fundraising walk it was just no. done for the exercise of it and just for the I wanted this young man who was staying with me to see. Not, not that, not that. The when when someone in the audience suggested. That I you're... see. I see. Yeah. yeah, we had. We started off. This was 2010. Yeah, it was October 2010. We had one walk, which was in New Jersey, because there was a park in New Jersey, and we had about 50 people maybe joining that walk. But then the next year, a number of people. Uh, I spent the fall of that year, I was in Michigan, actually. And there was a woman that I know from Michigan. Her name was Maureen, Maureen Bodenbach. She's a very devout Buddhist. So she organized Buddhists in Michigan to hold a walk through in near Ann Arbor at a park near Ann Arbor. I think Venable Mudita, was he the one from the Detroit Vihara, a yeah. group of monks from Detroit joined that walk. And then there was a group of uh, Aya Santusika, a nun in California. She picked up the idea of, hold, of conducting a walk. And so she mobilized a lot of people in the South Bay area around San Jose, Palo Alto, to do a, they did a very long walk of 16 miles, which was too too long, <laughs> but people were able to join the walk at any point along the way. So that was 2011, there were three walks, New York, Michigan, and California. Then the next year, more people picked up the idea of holding walks. So regularly we've been holding like about 10 walks in the US, including St. Louis, um, let's see. Gee, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting. Yeah. I'm getting old, so I'm forgetting yeah. things. Either. No, I think, but uh, I remember having a conversation with you. I think uh, I sent an email. I wanted to organize a similar thing here in Toronto, in no. downtown Toronto, uh, with your presence, but you were so busy last uh, couple of years, and you said uh, you would you are hoping to uh, make a special trip to Toronto to Canada so yeah. during that time we can organize it still I'm very interested in organizing such a oh, walk yeah that would be great yeah yeah that and, great. and here in Toronto also in in Ottawa in the capital city of Canada I uh, see I see yeah. so uh, I see uh, two hands raised uh, Bante Verapano from Washington DC uh, what do you have to say <laughs> Uh, we can't hear you. Something's wrong. Okay. We okay, can... I solved it. So uh, I wanted to bring up this question about, um, you know, there is plenty of suffering in the world and, and plenty of, you know, suffering to try and help with and to transform. So how do we determine as a as a monastic or someone wishing to to deal with the suffering of the world uh with of ourselves uh how do we determine to find that balance between spending all of our time helping others with their suffering and uh, addressing our own suffering or 
do those go in tandem? You know, how do we find that balance? Because for me, something that I really find is that there's a lot of there's a lot of empowerment that comes from community. There's a lot of um, inspiration for my practice that comes from working with other people's suffering, and can also be very difficult, um, but very uh, kind of pushes me to to be uh, meditating and to be aware and to be watching my mind very closely. So how do we kind of find that balance between helping others to alleviate their suffering and uh, focusing on alleviating our, our own suffering and doing our own suffering? Uh, okay, Sister Kema raised her hand. <laughs> you want to... First, first identifying, identifying the connection of all of us together. And you're right, because, uh, because uh, when you say that you are, you are gaining something by helping other people, that's, that's right. And it depends on where you are in your development. But uh, I have people come to me who are very, very stressed out or very older people who uh, you know, they uh, have free time, but they, they spend their time caught in the past and caught in past and caught events and they need to rebalance. And the best way for them to rebalance is to help someone else, is to go and help other people in a close way. For instance, if you just have your leg in a cast, then you should go help a man who has no leg. It's easy over here because there's so much of that, unfortunately, but it's true. You know, I've done that with people. You need to go if you if you are having some real trouble with your eyes. Well, you can read, but you can still read. You should go read for someone who has no eyes. Or if you, you know, uh, this is this is a real it sounds funny, but if you go and you work with another person, you are relieving yourself. So that's part of it. But you need to get a good foundation first. I bet everybody here would agree that you need to have a good foundation on the teaching so that you can help yourself. You see, as well, during the time that you're working with the other person or the other people, and you, you see it all come together and all weave together because there's this interrelationship of we're all made of stardust, so to speak. You yeah. see? <laughs> it is also, okay. Um... Um, I know we can actually have another lot of discussion uh, about this topic, uh, how to alleviate our own sufferings at the same time to alleviate the sufferings of other beings. Um, um, Bhante Jinananda, I think BCC, that's Bhante Jinananda from Ottawa, you raised your hand. Uh, is your video on? Venerable uh, Bhante, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. As a result of being practical in Buddhism, I cannot show you my video today because <laughs> I'm in a busy environment at the temple, helping some people who work for the Cardinal Ceremony. So I, I thought I should become more practical today with Buddhist teaching. Uh, that's why I uh, did not come to the discussion uh, act actively with the video. So today I thought when I think about the topic, uh, I don't I be mindful about the uh, different activities we do. Like, you know, when we talk about the practical Buddhism, it sounds like we should be apply Buddhist teaching into the practical situation. So uh, as individuals, no matter monks or lay people, we should be living with something we do. That, is, that sounds uh, very well by Pante Rahula with MNM, MNM. MM, a meditation. So, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of explaining practical Buddhism, what I uh, always emphasize is the Satipatthana, because it is a full, complete menu about how an individual, uh, you know, take the Buddha's teaching into uh, into into our life and experience something. Then you realize that. Buddhist teaching is being practical in our experience. So when you do uh, your own activities on, on daily basis, being mindful about them is the entrance to practical Buddhism. I think uh, that is well addressed in uh, uh, Yutadamo's uh, book. Uh, I, I read some uh, se section about 
how he uh, conceptualized some deep teaching into simplest form. So he also confirmed that, that if we are able to understand what the Buddha means by being mindful, by being wise, uh, and that is how one enters into practical Buddhism. So uh, we, I, I listened to some of those wonderful explanations by bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Um, what I finally uh, you know, understood is that these great monks also uh, have taken some aspect of the Dhamma into their practice. And that's how they uh, you know, explain about the practical Buddhism. This shows uh, in the verse uh, Swakato uh, Bhagavata Dhammu at the end of it, Pachatang Vedita Bhavinyohiti. When we talk about the practical Buddhism, it differs from person to person, place to place, and uh, of what we do, and it differs also. So we cannot put a kind of framework uh, that this is the practical Buddhism because there are so many things. Buddhism is just like a vast ocean, and we cannot see everything at once but we can understand things, uh, this could be happening this way and that could happen in that way and so on. But when it comes to real, real practical application of Buddhism, we all have our own patterns. So uh, I think uh, Bhikkhu Yutadamu has taken two main discourses uh, like Sabhasa Sutta and Griman and the Sutta to explain the practical Buddhism as he thinks, as the Buddha thinks. So that's how we have to go with the practical Buddhism. The reason why I say this is because some people who listen to the discussion might understand that, that when we talk about practical Buddhism, which part of Buddhism is more practical and uh, which part of Buddhism is less practical and what can we do with Buddhism when we live in the West and in the East and as householders, as monks and so on. I think uh, it depends on personal capacities but uh, at the same time, I really appreciate what those monks said, especially uh, Bhikkhu, uh, Bhikkhu uh, uh, Rahul, Bhante Rahul and Bhikkhu Bodhi and other monks. So being practical uh, means we apply even a little things of the Buddha's teaching. Then we feel that. So then we can say this is practical. I think uh, uh, that's what I wanted to say. I'm sorry that uh, for not showing uh, we, myself in the video because... I'm just walking and uh, uh, being practical. Uh, that is why I'm not uh, listening to, because I should be with the activities uh, everybody involved with here. I thought yeah. that is practical. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante Jinananda, for sharing your insights uh, and you're being uh, practical and at the same time impractical by not showing yourself, your face to the <laughs> audience. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, I know I have some great questions uh, from the audience in the YouTube. I would like to take their question, but I see Bhante Sila, you raised your hand. Uh, would you, uh, you can, this is your uh, turn to share your insights, Bhante Sila from uh, Minnesota, uh, Milwaukee. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, um, I'll let him figure out <laughs> the technical okay. thing. Okay. Right, sure. okay, now now we can hear you. Okay, Bante, I am I'm working as a hospital chaplain over the last 10 years. Uh -huh. I can't, I wear my robe and walk into the hospital uh, patient's rooms and everybody see at me as a Buddhist monk. That is my most important thing because that is what I wanted to do. And I can't promote any religion. I can't advise people. Only thing I can do is I can assist people to get out of any kind of uh, troublesome situation, mental situations they are in. You know that actually, the last week and I think Thursday or Friday, I was with the I was with the woman. She had a, a had the surgery. Unfortunately, she doctor had found that there had been infection on the place where they, he had done the, the surgery on her on her leg. She was so afraid of of amputation that she had 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 a idea that 
she would lose her leg. Doctor may suggest to amputate the leg. Leg. She was crying and crying and crying. The nurse called me and asked me to come and help this woman to uh, do whatever it is possible to console this woman. Actually, I what I said, I I told her, I told her to just understand that your leg is okay. Doctor is working on that. Doctor never suggested, never still doctor has not suggested you to you you that he has to amputate your leg. And just bring your complete attention to this moment of your life. You are thinking about the future. What will happen tomorrow or day after tomorrow, next week, maybe. Right? You are thinking of how to how you live with your family, how you can spend your time in a in a wheelchair, as you said. Then then she needed to learn how to be present in mind. I remembered that uh, Master Tichnathan's book, Peace in Every Step, he says that how what he did when he first came to New York in, um, at the last days of the, of the New Vietnam War, when he was, when, when the people, when people came to know that he was in, in New York in a hotel, they had gathered at the entrance of the, of the, of the hotel shouting at him do not get out of this one this uh, you, you, from the hotel but he got out of the hotel when he came to the to the people the people just moved back what he had done was he had walked for i think two or three miles i can't remember I very many years back i read that book one or two miles without doing anything just just turning his head down, he walked and walk, came back. Then the people had confused that, oh, is that, what is that? Why he came to New York just to walk in silence? Mm -hmm. That is how it started. I think what we, sh I, what I am doing is I do not, I am not, the people ask me at the end, are you a Buddhist monk or what, how, from where did you learn this? All over last last 10, 10 years, anything had I had done had never been unsuccessful. I have many people, I, I have changed, helped many people to change, solve their family problems. Sometimes people call me later and tell me, please tell us what to do in this kind of a situation. That is what I think we should bring to the this is this is practical this is theory this is this is impractical not, not what is that is that is what in my personal experience is just learn to be calm and help people in whatever it is a situation mm, thank you thank you about the sila i think that oh, of course uh, buddhist teachings uh, can be brought to the the people all, all, all walks of life in a very practical way. The, the, you know, as we said, the whole purpose of the uh, teachings of the Buddha, and uh, I think some Sutra Buddha made it very clear, my whole purpose is to talk about the suffering and to talk about the end of the, the suffering. So wherever the suffering is, if you can help that person uh, become free from suffering, and I think... Uh, we, we can uh, bring that practical Buddhism to any part of the society. So uh, I know we, we, are, we don't have much time. I have some great questions from, some, uh, from the audience. And uh, thank you, Sandini and Anoma, for your kind words. Uh, here is a, I think I would like to take this question. Bhante Bodhi said that he had a dream to walk <laughs> in, in New York City. So this is regarding a dream, uh, which says it's come from Bhavani. Uh, uh, Namaste. How are, how are thoughts and dreams different? Do dreams come from past life experiences? Uh, does anyone have anything to say about that question? And Bhante Bodhi said you had a dream to walk. Is that based on your past experience? <laughs>
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so probably, probably not a past life experience because I'm not sure that I ever lived in Manhattan in a past life. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't. Uh, you would not end up in Asia, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, dreams are come from the past. Sorry? Dreams are come from the past. Uh-huh. They, if they, they have, also come from in digestion. They, yeah, if they had a, if they had a previous life, then it could be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the Sankicha, you raise your hand. Uh, well, uh, that's what I was also thinking, you know, when we learn about our mind, you know, how it works, how our mind can be very sensitive and uh, connections even during the sleep, you know, uh, as somebody mentioned, our dreams are coming from the past. Uh, so, of course, our mind can sense, you know, sometimes feel our past life experiences too, even though we are not aware of them. You know, that's, uh, even though we don't have any way to make these connections, since we are not fully aware of uh, our past life experiences, but in our unconscious mind, even though uh, we are not aware of them, the uh, dreams can manifest, you know, I mean, uh, you know, past life experiences can be manifested in our dreams, uh, I think. Okay. Any other not, not, not all not all dreams come from the past. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And they, you know, our mind has the ability to feel and uh, be sensitive to the future as well. You know, because some people uh, sense uh, what will happen tomorrow or later, right? So mind is a wonderful experience in that way. Some dreams are like a manifest what, what a deeper inner uh, goal or something that you're aspiring to, then dreams will come out to kind of indicate maybe certain things that, uh, you know, would be useful to, to do, but without your consciously knowing it. And so you might wind up doing uh, something, uh, but without knowing it necessarily came from a dream. Like uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's experience, you know, he, he living in New York and he thought to walk down in Manhattan, but, but that, uh, because, you know, his, his compassion and wanting to do a lot for the Dhamma, maybe that w was an idea. And then these other people suggested, <laughs> you know, doing, you know, it evolved like that. Who knows? I think it's, uh, it's worth to have a different topic uh, about the dreams. I think, you know, I have uh, heard from Bhante Kamalasiri here, you know, a lot about dreams, you know, as the ultimate purpose of the practicing of the Dhamma is also about coming out of our dreams, mm. right? Dream worlds. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating topic actually to talk about. Yeah, I think, I think we, will, uh, we will have another discussion on the same uh, topic about dreams. <laughs> but I, I have two uh, great questions, I have three more questions, uh, if possible, to answer this from the audience. Uh, Stacy Ann is asking a question. In the Vedic tradi tradition, Buddha is regarded highly, especially among the Hare Krishnas, who view Buddha as revolutionary, especially in regard to the ending of animal sacrifice. Did Buddha appreciate the Vedic tradition? Maybe that's a scholarly question that is not so directly related to practical Buddhism. Practical Buddhism, okay. <laughs> so maybe we need to have a scholarly discussion about that. Then uh, we are going to pass that question. Uh, so here's a, a question from uh, Fong Tran. Um, I am having difficulties forgiving myself more than forgiving others. How can I change my thoughts to be kinder to myself and not be my own enemy. I think Bhante Rahula, you did touch about this a bit. Uh, would you like to answer this question? Well, uh, we have to also have compassion for ourselves and our foibles or our weaknesses and so on. You know, we have, you know, until we reach uh, some high levels where we get beyond that. But so, uh, 
but you know the Buddha always uh, said also to you know we have to have compassion, but at the same time you have to uh, be a little bit you know you have to be determined not to try to uh, to repeat the same sorts of unskillful uh, actions or like you know breaking the precepts over and over again or mm. other ways of uh, thinking. Now, these don't stop overnight for most people. It takes a lot of, of training to, to be able to, but to, to see the intention before you, you, you think or the intention before you do some action. And that's why the M&Ms are actually good because it helps you, it helps you to train that when something is coming up to pause so you can reflect on it. Is this really something I want to do? Uh, and then apply the right effort to not to repeat that action or to to uh, apply the uh, the opposite type of uh, you know uh, uh, substitution of the wholesome uh, thing for it to to stop that repetition. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bante Verpanyo, you raised your hand. Uh, okay. I just like to add to what. Um... Bhante Rahula said, if you aren't already following some precept, maybe you add in some precept, and this can help. Okay. So maybe to be vegetarian or to uh, not participate in killing or stealing or these kinds of things, and this will bring a, a meaningfulness to your daily life. And now, because you're living a meaningful life, you you can look to that rather than those old things, those past difficulties to uh, understand yourself and relate to yourself. So if you aren't already following some precept, you can start to follow some and, and that can maybe help as well. Okay, great, great uh, insights. And here's another uh, question. Actually, um, uh, someone by the kit uh, said, shut up to Bhante Varapanyo, may he be free from technical audio suffering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another question uh, from Steffi, uh, who is watching us on uh, YouTube. I currently live with a sibling who is narcissistic, alcoholic. What would be the appropriate way of responding to his negative projections and constant need to start fights and arguments? Be positive him. What's that? Be positive him. Be positive. Be positive, positive about him. Him, okay. Yeah. And <laughs> anything else? Bante, come on, we don't see you. I think you fix your camera. Okay, now. Sorry. I wanted to say the first of all, be positive about him. Uh huh. Yeah, and be friendly and kindful to him. Okay. Maybe it's an example of how Patita Samupada could be used practically. If we we'll go back yeah. to that, <laughs> to understand the, the 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 way things arise, that it's not actually a him; it's just habits that he's evolved, and they're habits that are caught up in ignorance. But also to look at your experience of him as Patita Samupada, because for you, there's arising a, a reaction to your experiences. And to understand that that's what's happening. It's not you having a problem. It's you experiencing seeing him, hearing him speak, and those experiences evolving through ignorance to craving and wanting things to be different and trying to change things and, and getting caught up in the whole mass of suffering as a result. Mm. Anything else? Uh... I think that uh, we well, the first thing we should do is that not to, to not to try to correct him <laughs> okay or to order him to not uh, stop it uh, you are stupid right instead that we should be kind to listen to that person and persuade him to talk no we are not talking but we are just listening and helping them that want to talk and to come to the to the reason what the reason of his being uh, drunk. Okay. And Bhante Bodhi, I would be interested in your insights. Mm. 
Bante Bodhi kat Malaysia ni? Ya, he ingat ni tu. Might be wise to either kick him out if you're living together. <laughs> Or, or to move out yourself, if possible. <laughs> if somebody is an alcoholic, I have to say it's very difficult to get them to change unless they see the problem for themselves and have the wish to break out of that habit. Mm. Preaching will not change the person. Yeah. Yeah. There's a compassionation out from there. What is that? Where's our compassion? Yeah. There's, can I just say yeah. one thing? Yeah, there, there is a compassionate thing, Bounty, in the United States that's called tough love. And yeah. I think uh, think uh. about pointing to that. Tough love with alcoholism is an extremely difficult thing. First of all, there are two people involved in the story. There is the alcoholic who has an addiction. It's not just a habit. It's an addiction. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. A very serious thing that affects his mind. Alcoholism, yeah. when a person comes to an addiction at 17 or 18, stops their mind growing, their brain stops. So there's a six, you don't know if it's a 16 year old that's sitting in front of you, if they're 40 years old, you have to figure out actually who's there. But the biggest thing Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi is pointing to, and I can speak from authority, you know, from a background where I helped people with this a lot, trying to figure out how to keep their own sanity, protect themselves compassionately. You have to either move out or have the person move out. It doesn't mean you don't support them. Now, the question of compassion is a delicate matter, okay? Compassion can be a stagnant compassion where you do just sit there and allow yourself to have someone who is who is intoxicated speak to you for three or four hours and demand that you continue to stay there for two more while they continue drinking. Or you can look at compassion a little bit differently. Let's look at compassion as an active form of compassion, which we've defined in our school, we've sort of defined this way. I see a person who is in pain, number one. Number two, I understand that person's pain is their pain it is not mine and i cannot fix that person no. the the children of alcoholics or or the relatives or relationships in families with alcoholics ruin their lives totally if they believe they can change that person now the third one is the third part is i can love them unconditionally and i can try to figure out you know what their need is to have happen but i must protect myself in this situation you see you must do that uh, otherwise you can ruin your whole entire life and yeah. your family yeah. can it's a just devastating things can happen so how can i help them i you know you i had one person decide well i will leave but sister first i'm going to help them get a place to live pay their first electric bill see if they can have a job walking uh, you know maybe as a security guard or something like that so they're not just not doing anything there's a number of ways we can help the person to stabilize themselves and we can explain uh, the buddhavrakata sutta to them the path and the future and the present and try to get them to understand if they keep sitting there dwelling on the past for the rest of their life, you can explain this to them and let them contemplate and reflect on the fact that that past event has happened. It is fixed in time and there's no energy in it anymore. Just the way the future isn't here, so let's not put our energy from today in the future. So if you can try to teach them about one day's energy and staying in the present time for a day and try to help them even get a job where they have something to do other than sit with a bottle. That's how you help the person. But you don't just you don't just give them the idea, I respect what you're doing, or this way you don't argue with them. You, you can love them, but you do not have to succumb to the situation. And tough love is a hard thing when you have to put a son out or a woman has to put her husband out or a wife. You know, it's a tough thing. Very tough. That's why it's called tough love. Mm 
Mm. And that program is very successful, but you have to understand all the elements of the alcoholic and the ramifications on the family members completely. Yeah. Wonderful. I think uh, uh, One Love by Bob Marley to Tough Love by Sister Kema. <laughs> <laughs> I think I wish I wish I had more time to continue this wonderful discussion. I know there are more people are very keen. They are interested in this discussion. They are watching us in YouTube, Facebook, and uh, uh, but we uh, really had a very productive discussion on practical Buddhism two times, uh, two weeks ago and today. And of course, we can talk about this topic endlessly. Uh, I'm very grateful to all of you, venerable uh, monks and nuns. Uh, 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 thank you for uh, being so uh, enthusiastic and generous in sharing the insights uh, uh, with uh, us and the people to alleviate the sufferings and pains of the people. And, uh, and to help people. This, we are doing this bi-weekly uh, Sutra discussion uh, with that uh, mission in mind. So um, I'm very grateful to you and my respect and homage to all the senior venerable monks uh, who are here, uh, including Bhante Bodhi, Bhante Rahula, Bhante Uparatana, uh, Bhante Kamalasiri, and these uh, senior monks here to me. And I think Bhante Siva too. <laughs> I don't know maybe we are the same. Yeah. And uh, and all blessings be with you. And nuns, uh, yeah, not only monks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> so um, uh, I would like to uh, also give our blessings to our friends who are watching us on YouTube and Facebook. And thank you for joining this discussion. Uh, we are hoping to see you in two weeks' time, but. Before we end this, uh, uh, we have a tradition uh, concluding the discussion by reciting the Ovada Pate Mokka. Uh, so I would like to respectfully invite uh, Bante Katugasuto Paratana from Washington, D.C. to recite uh, the Ovada Pate Mokka. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sab papas. Akaranang Kusalas Upasampada Sachit Pariyo Dapanang Etang Buddhan Sasanang Kanti paramang tapu titikka nibbanam paramang vadanti buddha nahi pabjito parupagati samnohoti Parang vihet yanto Anup vado Anup gato Pati mokke sangwaro Matanyuta jabhatasming Pantanch sayana senang Adhichitte ayogo Etang buddhan sasanang Sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That was so beautiful, Bhante Uparatana, how you recited those Ovada Pratimukta uh, verses. It was so beautiful that uh, took me to Sri Lanka, how the venerable monks recite these gathas in loudspeakers. And I felt very great, my respect and gratitude to you, Bhante Uparatana. You. And once again, uh, I'm very uh, grateful to Bhante Bodhi, Bhante Rahula for 
accepting uh, my personal invitations to join our bi-weekly sutra discussions. And uh, we are hoping to have your presence in, 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 in the future discussions because your presence uh, gives us a lot of motivation, <laughs> a lot of inspiration. So it, maybe it is my tanha, it's my attachment <laughs> to have you in every discussion. And of course, other venerable monks and nuns, venerable Yutadamo, uh, venerable Verapanyo, venerable Sila, venerable Puratana, venerable Kusala, venerable Jinananda, sister Kema, and of course, venerable Samtan. So then all of you continue to become part of this bi weekly discussion. And may all of you have all the blessings of the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha for your long life with good health and happiness. May all devas continue to protect and guard you with the divine blessings. Uh, and may you be well, happy, and peaceful. May all sentient beings be well, happy, and peaceful. Good night from Canada. I'm hoping to see you all in two weeks' time. Bye-bye.